Okay, so let's talk about bonded, bonding, main bonding jumper, system bonding jumper, equipment bonding jumper, equipment bonding conductor, supply side bonding jumper, all of the bonding related definitions in Article 100. So we'll start with the basic one, which is bonded. So what does it mean when we say that, that something has been bonded? Well, that means it's connected to establish electrical continuity and conductivity. All right, so there's two main reasons that we would bond things together. And if we start over here on the right with the uh, rebar for the swimming pool, We've got all of our rebar here that's going to be, uh, you know, creating the steps in the swimming pool and then it goes down and the shell of the swimming pool and you've got the deck of the swimming pool. And of course, you've also got your luminaires inside the pool, your diving board, your grab bars, all of these things. And what the code requires us to do in 680.26 is bond all of these things together. Now, why would we do that? Well, we're doing it to ensure that they're all the same voltage. Uh, if you've ever tried to measure voltage on one wire, we know that you won't get any voltage because voltage is defined as the difference in potential between at least two objects. So if I connect everything together electrically, then I've made it one unit and I can't measure voltage on one item. So if I bond everything together, then everything that I've connected to each other should be the same voltage when I go to test it with my meter. So bonding ensures the same voltage and we do that for swimming pools here on the right. We also do it uh, at agricultural facilities for equal potential planes like the floor of the, uh, of the barn and we do it around natural and artificially made bodies of water. Over here on the left is the more common type of bonding same definition applies, you're connecting things to establish uh, continuity and conductivity, but what are we bonding here when we install this bonding bushing? Well, ultimately, we are bonding the connector and the conduit to the enclosure, right? We're ensuring that connection. Now, why do we want that to be? Well, same reason, we want it to be the same voltage. You certainly want the raceway and the enclosure to be the same voltage if they weren't, and one of them had a fault, then you could walk up and touch them and you might get 120 or 277 volts between them. So obviously that's an, uh, a dangerous situation. The other thing that we want to do when we bond is we want to ensure uh, a good, reliable path back to the source to open circuit breakers or fuses in the event of a ground fault. So if I have anything, everything connected together electrically and connected to the windings of the transformer or the generator, then if something becomes energized, then it's essentially like taking the hot and hitting it against the neutral, right? We have a short circuit. That fault current travels back to the source. The circuit breaker or fuse sees a massive amount of current and it opens the circuit protection device to make sure that it's safe and doesn't kill whoever's touching it. So those are the two reasons that we bond. To ensure the same voltage and to initiate an overcurrent device in the event of a ground fault. We've also got a definition for bonding conductor or bonding jumper, and that's a reliable conductor that provides conductivity between metal parts that are required to be electrically connected. Okay, so here we've got all of these underground raceways. Now, when I have an underground raceway like this, if I have a metal sweep on there, those things have to be bonded to each other unless they're covered with 18 inches of dirt. And the reason for that is if there was a fault inside one of those raceways and it energized that metal 90, if it wasn't bonded to the other metal objects and back to the source, if it wasn't bonded, then it would become energized and it would stay energized. And then uh, anybody that could touch it could possibly get shocked. Now, if it was under, you know, two inches of dirt, that could potentially be a problem. You know, if this is a 277 volt fault, and you've got the conduit and two inches of dirt, if you were standing on that two inches of dirt, that's not enough resistance to get enough voltage drop to, to make it safe. Whereas if I had this thing buried five feet in the dirt, the resistance of five feet of earth is enough that if I was standing on the dirt barefoot, I would not get the full effects of that 277 volt uh, metal object being in contact with the dirt, right? It's not gonna travel all the way through the earth at that high of a resistance. But if I only had just a, a little bit of dirt on top of that conduit and the conduit became energized and I was standing on it, you could definitely get shocked. So 
this bonding jumper, this copper wire, is a bonding jumper. Like I said, it's a reliable conductor that provides conductivity between metal parts that are required to be electrically connected. We also have equipment bonding jumpers, and that's the connection between portions of the equipment grounding conductor. All right, so up here I've got some rigid metal conduit, and I'm using that rigid metal conduit as my required equipment grounding conductor. And that is perfectly legal, nothing wrong with that. Uh, 250.118, I think item number two, says that I can use rigid metal conduit or IMC or EMT as my equipment grounding conductor. I've also got some flexible metal conduit here, and only in limited applications may I use the flexible metal conduit as an equipment ground. Never can you use it for this size of flex. Never can you use it in, uh, in circuits over 60 amps. So this is a greater than 60 amp circuit, which means the flexible metal conduit itself cannot be used as the required equipment ground. There would have to be a green wire inside of it. Well, there's not a green wire inside of it because I'm using the rigid metal conduit as my equipment ground. So I'm going to have to bond around that to do what? To ensure conductivity and continuity between the raceway, the flexible metal conduit, and the remaining portion of the installation. And I'm going to do that with an equipment bonding jumper. The next definition is main bonding jumper. And you know, when I was inspecting, I, I never really used checklists as an inspector. I have nothing against them. Uh, it was just something that I, I never really did. If I were to use a checklist though as an inspector, this would be my number one item. This would be the first thing to check on any inspection because this, in my opinion, is the single most important connection in the entire building. Think about that for a minute. If you have a big commercial building, let's say, thousands of different connections, it's rather interesting that you could point at one specific connection out of all the thousands in that building and say, that's the most important. Well, in my opinion, the main bonding jumper is the most important. That's the connection between the utility neutral conductor and the premises's equipment grounding conductor or supply side bonding jumper. Okay, so it connects what? The utility neutral to the metal parts of the electrical installation. All right, so if you think about it, you have all the green wires in your building, your equipment grounding conductors. If you follow those back to the service disconnect where we meet with the utility, the utility does not provide a green wire going back to the source, do they? They just provide two or three hot conductors and a neutral. So how do we get fault current from the equipment grounding conductors back to the source if the utility doesn't have an equipment ground? Well, we connect our equipment grounding conductors to the utility neutral conductor at the service disconnect. And that ensures that any fault current travels back on the equipment ground, back on the utility neutral, back to the transformer, completes a circuit, and then the breaker sees a huge amount of current and it opens in the event of a ground fault. If I didn't have the main bonding jumper, we lose that connection between the equipment grounds and the utility neutral. If we don't have the main bonding jumper, we do not trip breakers or open fuses in the event of a ground fault. It's that simple. If you don't have the main bonding jumper, when you have a ground fault, metal parts will remain energized. So the main bonding jumper is absolutely critical. Now it can be a wire like this. It can be a bus bar or a strap, which is what we're looking at right here. So that connects the utility neutral to the metal parts. Or it can be a green screw like this. And yes, for this one, it actually does have to be green. I think that's in 250.28D uh, if I'm not mistaken. So this can also be the main bonding jumper. It's the conductor strap or screw that bonds the utility neutral to the metal parts at the service disconnect. Again, the most important uh, termination in the entire installation. If I'm installing a transformer or maybe a separately derived system like a generator, and we'll talk about separately derived systems once we get to the letter S in definition, but if I'm installing one of those, I might have to install the same concept, a connection between neutral and the equipment grounding conductors, at the source. And when we do that, we don't call it a main bonding jumper because a main bonding jumper can only happen at the service disconnect. 
we do the same thing, but we call it a system bonding jumper because we are bonding the system, the actual windings of the transformer. We are bonding those to the metal parts of the premises wiring system. So a system bonding jumper is the connection between the neutral and the equipment grounding conductor or supply side bonding jumper or both at a separately derived system. All right, so looking at this photograph here, we've got our XO point, which is the neutral point of our delta Y transformer, and we are connecting it to the metal parts of the new system. So that's our system bonding jumper. Again, we might have that in a generator or other separately derived system as well. The last definition for this video is supply side bonding jumper. So a supply side bonding jumper is, is exactly what it sounds like. It's a bonding jumper that's on the supply side. Well, the supply side of what? Well, the supply side of the service for sure, but also the supply side of a separately derived system's first over current device. This is something that has always bothered me. Let, let's read the definition really quick and I'll explain. It's a conductor that bonds metal parts on the supply side of a service disconnect or between the source of a separately derived system and its first disconnect. When I think of the supply side of a transformer, you automatically tend to think the primary, right? Because that's, <laughs> that is the supply side of a transformer. But that's not what we're talking about here. Uh, when we talk about a bonding jumper on the supply side, we mean, like here in the photograph, this green wire that's bonding these conductors on the supply side of the service, that is definitely a supply side bonding jumper. But also, if we have a transformer, and you have your primary, it's got a conduit with your three hots and uh, an equipment grounding conductor, and then on your secondary side, maybe you have three hots, a neutral, and a green wire going to your first panel or a fuse disconnect. What do we call that green wire? By definition, it's not an equipment grounding conductor because an equipment grounding conductor has a breaker or fuse that it can trip. The supply side bonding jumper kind of doesn't. It's upstream of that system's first, uh, first overcurrent device. So a supply side bonding jumper is on the supply side service or it's on a separately derived system before the separately derived system's first overcurrent device.